Okay, so if I were to crack open your skull and start poking around your brain with an electrode, there's a few specific locations called hedonic hotspots, which could be stimulated to make you feel intense pleasure. These pleasure generators are responsible for your enjoyment of everything from food, friends and family, to spiritual and religious experiences, to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now, one of these is a tiny region in the brain called the nucleus accumbens. If I were to stimulate that area while you were, say, eating an ice cream cone, you would suddenly find that it tasted much better. Now, delicious ice cream is an example of sensory pleasure. It's not only sensory pleasures that activate the hedonic hotspots, but all kinds of pleasure, including something as cerebral as your enjoyment of this video about the neuroscience of pleasure. At least, I hope you're enjoying it, and if you are, consider giving this video a like. Now, if you think of pleasure through an evolutionary lens, this makes a lot of sense. The brain originally evolved a pleasure system to make the organism want to gain calories by eating food and encourage it to have sex, both of which stimulate hedonic hotspots. So for a simple organism, its only goals are really survival and reproduction. So it makes sense that pleasure would be attached to the attainment of these goals. But over evolutionary time, as animals gathered into complex social groups and their goals became more abstract, pleasure became less and less directly connected to survival. So in current times, the objects or experiences which produce pleasure in a developed human brain can therefore be highly abstract, and they may even be entirely disconnected from survival. So a well-crafted sentence in a novel can give a dollop of pleasure to the literary enthusiast while those same words may do nothing for the tobacco aficionado who instead feels it while puffing his favorite Cuban cigar. Now, as different as ice cream, sex, and a well-written sentence and Cuban cigars are, the pleasure they induce is brought about by the activation of a handful of brain regions scattered throughout the frontal cortex and the limbic dopamine system. By the way, don't worry about any of that technical jargon. You do not need to memorize it, and it will all become clear as we proceed. Also, I'm Andrew, and this is Sense of Mind. If you like neuroscience, consider subscribing. Okay, back to pleasure. In a moment, I'll mention several brain regions, but just remember that there are two main pleasure networks that together form the brain's pleasure system. One is in the subcortical brain regions, those structures found deep in the brain underneath the cerebral cortex, which is the folded and convoluted structure that you think of when you picture a brain. And the other pleasure network is in the cerebral cortex itself. For simplicity, let's call the subcortical pleasure network the core pleasure network, and let's call the cortical network the higher pleasure network. The core pleasure network is composed of several brain areas. And remember that you don't have to memorize these, like the nucleus accumbens, the ventral pallidum, and an area of the brainstem called the parabrachial nucleus. These regions work together rather like a board of directors at a corporation, where everyone, or at least the majority of the board members, must agree in order for a decision to be made. In this case, the decision would be whether to activate the feeling of pleasure or not. If one of them activates in response to some stimulus, like the taste of ice cream, you may feel pleasure only if the other core hedonic hotspots are also active. This usually happens in a kind of chain reaction, where one activates and recruits the others to activate as well. And this results in an enhanced feeling of pleasure. However, if one of these regions votes no, then pleasure will not be enhanced, and it may cease entirely. This is likely an evolutionarily ancient pleasure network, but there's also a relatively new pleasure network situated in the frontal cortex, the one we've called the higher pleasure network. So instead of generating pleasure as the core network does, the higher network seems to make sense of and interpret the pleasurable stimuli and possibly also enhance pleasure to some degree. So for example, let's say you're eating that ice cream cone. While the core network is generating the feeling of pleasure, your frontal cortex, the higher network, is telling you that the source of that pleasure is the ice cream cone, and moreover, that it's your favorite flavor, and even that this moment reminds you of wonderful memories of eating ice cream as a child. The higher network is connected to the core network, so it can evaluate and interpret the activity occurring in the core network. These higher network regions 
include the prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, cingulate cortex, and insular cortex. And these are all part of the frontal cortex. Now the orbitofrontal cortex may be the region responsible for your experience of pleasure. This region is just behind your eyes where the front of your brain folds over to meet the subcortical regions. Now, regardless of the anatomy, the important thing to remember is that this region's activity is tightly correlated to how much you like something. The activity goes up when you experience greater pleasure and down when you experience a decline in pleasure. This region is thus central to cognitive evaluation. That is the process by which you decide how valuable a given thing is to you, whether it's a plate of food, an investment opportunity, a potential future outcome, or really anything else. The last thing I want to mention about the higher pleasure network relates to a fascinating fact about the frontal cortex. It's organized along a concrete to abstract gradient. The prefrontal cortex is really important for planning and executing actions in order to achieve goals. If you think about any simple goal, for example, grocery shopping, you actually have to break that abstract goal down into more concrete sub goals, like walking to your car, driving to the store, getting out of your car, going inside, consulting your shopping list, paying for the groceries and so on. And each of those sub goals can be broken down into even more concrete sub sub goals. At the most concrete level, you have to break them down into the individual muscle contractions corresponding to walking, driving, handing money to the cashier, etc. So in order to execute those muscle contractions, the motor cortex has to tell the spinal cord to tell muscles to contract. And that means that these most concrete of goals, the muscular contractions, are housed in the motor cortex. And the motor cortex is just behind the prefrontal cortex. So amazingly, it appears that the more abstract the goal, the further into the prefrontal cortex its representation. So in other words, there's a gradient of goal representation that gets more and more abstract as you move closer and closer to the front of the brain and more and more concrete as you move backward toward the motor cortex. Okay, great, but what does this have to do with pleasure? As you know, pleasure can be more or less abstract. You can feel a highly concrete sensory pleasure, like the taste of sweet ice cream, as we've been talking about. And you can experience abstract pleasures, like winning chips at a casino while playing poker, or even more abstractly, watching your favorite sports team score a point on TV. And just as the goals and the actions needed to achieve them become more and more abstract as you move toward the very front of the frontal cortex, pleasures become more abstract as you move toward the front of the orbital frontal cortex. So the sweet taste of ice cream would be represented further back while the most abstract pleasures like watching your team win would be represented closer to the front. Now, before we summarize this video, I wanna to talk to you about how you can use this knowledge to increase your own happiness. We often think that happiness is all about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. But that's a mistake. Happiness is about more than just pleasure. And it's certainly about more than just sensory pleasure. Happiness also has another more meaningful side to it called eudaimonia or a life well lived. It's what most of us refer to as meaning and purpose, which are usually experienced as a result of doing things that we see as making us better people. Eudaimonia isn't always in conflict with pleasure, but they do sometimes butt heads. For example, it might give you no pleasure whatsoever to go through the process of having your blood drawn to donate it, but you do it because you want to help others or because you wanna be the type of person who sacrifices to help those in need. Regardless, it might seem that you have to trade one off for the other, despite the occasional experience that increases both. But that's really not true. In fact, when people are asked to rate how meaningful and pleasurable their lives are, they tend to rate both similarly. People who rate their lives as pleasurable also often rate them as meaningful. So when it comes to true happiness, the most important thing is to not confuse pleasure with desire. The neural mechanisms for pleasure are distinct from those of desire, though they're often coupled together. Thus, when we want to do something and we in fact do it, we tend to get pleasure from that experience. Yet desire and pleasure can become disconnected. People with severe drug addictions sometimes desire the drug without actually enjoying the high. Personally, I often want a donut, 
but after I eat it, I find that I don't enjoy it nearly as much as I'd expected. So it's undesirable to have desire without pleasure, but wouldn't it be great if we could have pleasure without desire? Maybe, and my only advice on that is that you regularly practice mindfulness meditation. In my experience, mindfulness allows you to disengage desire while still experiencing pleasure. This, however, takes hours of patient practice. And you might argue that pleasure without desire leads to laziness, a life of quiet meditation while the rest of the world is crumbling around you. In my experience, that's unrealistic because meditation encourages me to make more, not less, of my limited life. Regardless, maybe a better aim would be to have desire, pleasure, and eudaimonia perfectly in sync, such that you want to do meaningful things and doing them brings you pleasure. Now that requires self-understanding, but it also requires that we set challenging and achievable goals that are meaningful and afford some amount of fun while pursuing them. Achievable because striving after something you know is unattainable will only bring a sense of incompetence and you won't want to keep trying. They should be challenging because if you only do easy things, you'll never grow and you're unlikely to feel accomplished. Similarly, they should be meaningful because the eudaimonic side of happiness will never be satisfied if your goals are narrowly focused on how to maximize your own pleasure. Finally, in striving toward our ends, we should choose means that are fun or which put us in a flow state. In addition to making the journey more enjoyable, this may make us more effective, if only because it will make us want to do what we need to do. Okay, so to briefly summarize, pleasure is generated by two pleasure networks in the brain. The subcortical or core network and the cortical or higher network. The nodes of these networks are patches of brain tissue called hedonic hotspots, which are regions capable of activating and enhancing the experience of pleasure. In general, the core network is what produces the raw feelings of pleasure, whereas the higher network is responsible for interpreting, categorizing, and evaluating the source and intensity of pleasure. The higher network has a very important node situated in the orbital frontal cortex, which may be responsible for our conscious experience or appraisal of pleasure. Finally, the orbital frontal cortex seems to contain a gradient of concrete to abstract pleasure representations, mirroring the frontal cortex's concrete to abstract goal gradient. By the way, if you wanna learn more about the prefrontal cortex, check out my video about it. Lastly, when it comes to happiness, pleasure is important, but we can't have true happiness without meaning as well. Mindfulness meditation is one way of embracing pleasure while letting go of irrational desires. And to bring pleasure, desire, and meaning into alignment, we need to set goals that are challenging, achievable, and meaningful, and which provide some amount of fun along the way. All right, well, that's it. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode. Please be sure to like and subscribe to this channel or give the podcast a five-star rating on whatever platform you use. Also, be sure to check out my twice-monthly live stream podcast, with Taylor Guthrie, who's the host of the channel, The Cellular Republic. And finally, if you want even more neuroscience and psychology, be sure to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.